Brian Koberger's speedy trial clock is told by 37 days. Let's talk about the Elizabeth Holmes sentence. Uh, I'm going to explain complicity. And then finally, our dumb criminal of the day. Let's talk about it. Good day, everyone. My name is Scott Reich, and this is Crime Talk. Thanks for joining us. You know the drill. Subscribe if you haven't, like if you do, leave me a comment below, hit that little bell, and remember, you can listen to us anytime on any of your favorite podcasting apps. All right, let's go ahead and jump straight into the docket for July 11th, 2023. So please open the record. All right, Brian Koberger, speedy trials delayed for 37 days? Hmm. That's right. As you may recall, Brian Koberger's attorneys requested a stay in the tolling of the speedy trial, saying that there was substantial failure to comply with the selection procedures for the grand jury. Remember, the grand jury is the group of citizens, usually 15 or more, that hear a case to establish if there's probable cause. It's not a real trial. The defense isn't present. The prosecutor presents their evidence, and usually the grand jury rubber stamps the indictment, or they come back no bill if that's what the prosecutor wants. Pretty straightforward. As long as the grand jurors stated that they were fair and impartial, they are deemed to be sufficient grand jurors. So Brian Koberger's attorneys asked for an indefinite stay of the proceedings, but the court denied that. So the judge said that he was going to grant a stay for 37 days. And that is just the amount of time for Koberger and his defense to review the material from the grand jury proceedings. Now, originally, the prosecutors objected to Mr. Koberger's request, and then Mr. Koberger filed a sworn statement in support of the fact that the motion to stay the proceedings uh, was appropriate. However, the judge determined that the motion is premature since Koberger hasn't even yet reviewed the grand jury records, which were needed to actually say that something inappropriate had taken place. And since those aren't prepared just as of yet, the court granted the 37 days. So the court noted less than two weeks ago, the court agreed to release some of the grand jury materials for the defense to review. Despite this, the court determined that the Mr. Koberger and his defense have the right to review the material from the grand jury, as well as the right to challenge the grand jury selection process. The court ultimately denied Koberger's request to stay the proceedings, but due to the complexities of the case, however, the court did grant him time to review the material and decide whether they want to refile their motion to stay the proceedings to challenge the grand jury selection process. Now, the court acknowledged Mr. Koberger's right to the speedy trial and ordered a stay in the running of the speedy trial clock until August 1st. This allows him 37 additional days to review the material without giving him his right to a speedy trial. The judge said this motion does not affect any other aspect of the case or the trial's scheduled start date. Now, Koberger's trial start date is set to begin on October 2nd, but could be moved if the defense decides those extra 37 days aren't really enough to prepare for trial. Now, a hearing is uh, set to consider uh, any motions that Mr. Koberger has filed up to this date, and that will be held on August 18th at 10.30 a.m., and we will be listening and watching. Well, assuming they let us watch, we'll see. So what does this really mean? First, the defense had to file the motion alleging some sort of irregularities with the selection of the grand jury process. Why? Because it is a death penalty case. So what does this mean? First, the defense had to file the motion alleging some sort of irregularity with the grand jury selection process. However, without the transcripts, it's tough to make any argument that anything inappropriate took place. Uh, but one could even argue that the attorneys don't necessarily have a good faith basis when they haven't seen the grand jury transcripts. Although this is kind of a chicken and the egg problem, I can't tell if there's a problem until they give me the transcripts, but they won't give me the transcripts regarding the selection process because you're not entitled to it. The point is they filed this motion because it is a death penalty case. They will file every motion they can possibly uh, come up with and uh, they will comply with the time limits provided by the, any of the statutes so that they do not waive any of those motions. As you may recall, the defense had to file a notice of alibi, 
even though they hadn't really dug into the case and been able to say what the alibi was, they had to do that so it's not waved down the road. Now, second, motions alleging the grand jury uh, misconduct are rare, and they are granted even more rarely, <laughs> so you shouldn't lose any sleep. Now, I guess anything is possible. There's something that could come up, but I'm a little skeptical of that indeed. Next, let's talk about Elizabeth Holmes' sentence. As you may recall, Elizabeth Holmes received a sentence for 11 and a half years, basically, in federal prison for duping some very sophisticated people of lots of money because she thought that she had this, she had this product at the company called Theranos where she was going to be able to diagnose um, all kinds of diseases through a, a one drop of blood test, and it was going to be in every uh, pharmacy around the country. Well, it didn't quite work out that way. In fact, it turned out it never worked at all. Hence the reason she went to prison, even though a lot of very sophisticated people gave her a lot of money. And there's been a lot of headlines that Elizabeth Holmes' sentence has been reduced. Well, it hasn't been reduced. She's still going to serve her 11 and a half years. But that's right. She is going to receive good time credit while she is there. So a lot of news people are saying, oh my gosh, her release date is now December 29th of 2032. Now remember, she reported on May 30th and is now only set to receive a sentence of nine and a half years. Well, this is the reason why hopefully you come to Crime Talk because we know what we're talking about, whereas they do not. So the panic that somehow Elizabeth Holmes' sentence was reduced, there's nothing nefarious taking place here at all. Remember, she was convicted of fraud and conspiracy and got that 11 and a half year sentence. Well, 11 years is 132 months, plus the other six for the other half. So that's 138 months. Tracking with me so far? Then you do the math and you figure that she has to do 85% of her sentence comes out to 9.7 years. That's right. Got to do the math. It's called good time and earn time credit based upon basically good behavior in prison. Now, that can be taken away if Elizabeth Holmes were somehow to become a uh, prison gangster, uh, maybe doing tattooing in her cells, maybe having uh, contraband in her cells, something along those lines, she could lose her good time credit. But that is pretty much automatic unless you get in trouble. And what the news media also isn't telling you because they probably just don't know, they're not trying to keep it from you, is they just don't understand that the last six months of Elizabeth Holmes' sentence will actually be served in a halfway house. Once again, that is very normal in the federal system. Next, I'm going to explain complicity. We get a lot of comments where people say somebody did something and it is a conspiracy. Well, normally it's not a conspiracy, it's complicity. Now remember, a conspiracy is an agreement between two or more people to commit an illegal act. It's that simple. Complicity is a theory of prosecution where an actor can be charged as a principal even if they did not pull the trigger, like we will see in our example. So if you aid, assist, encourage someone to commit an illegal act, you can be held responsible for the act as if you, well, pulled the trigger yourself. Let's give an example. So two 18-year-olds and a 19-year-old were arrested on suspicion of murder after a man was shot and killed when they went to egg his house, apparently some sort of ongoing quarrel. And then on July 3rd, deputies were called to the home where they found a male deceased from an apparent gunshot wound. The victim did not have identification on him. However, through fingerprint analysis, they later identified the individual as a guy by the name of Jonathan Gilbert. He also reportedly went by the name of Tyler Lane. Well, police investigators found a witness who shared information with deputies that provided them information related to the shooting, and through that, they created a direct link between the victim and the suspects. Investigators then obtained one of the suspect's phone numbers and tracked them to a home in a different county. Police officers went to the home and executed a search warrant on the residence and the suspect's car. Investigators then reportedly found a gun believed to be used in the fatal shooting. Now, the deputies arrested Sidney Mogan and Jeremy Munson, who are 18, on charges of murder, malice, 
murder, aggravated assault, firearm possession during the commission of a crime, and criminal trespass. Mogan is also charged with battery, family violence as well. A third suspect, uh, Mackenzie Davenport, was taken into custody for malice, murder, battery, and criminal trespass. Well, the police allege that the suspects went to the home to egg the house due to an ongoing quarrel. It's not clear which of the suspects was involved in the quarrel or lover's quarrel, as it may be. Anyway, Gilbert reportedly caught the suspects egg in his house and he walked outside to confront them. He was reportedly unarmed. And as Gilbert moved towards them, Mogan, Munson, and Davenport reportedly ran back to the car. Mogan, who was in the car's back seat, produced a firearm and shot him multiple times. Then they drove away, leaving Gilbert dead in the middle of the street. The sheriff said the three all plotted and planned together, which leaves them all culpable. He added they went to Ega House. The victim confronted them while they were doing it. He lost his life and they drove off and left his body in the middle of the road. Together, they bought that ticket. Now they can ride that ride. All true. So remember, whenever somebody says they have a good idea and it involves something that sounds kind of dumb, don't go. Don't put yourself in that situation. The one thing I have learned over the years as a criminal defense attorney is just don't put yourself in bad situations. It certainly reduces the chances that you're going to get involved in some sort of criminal conduct. And here, all three individuals encouraged the conduct and somebody died in the commission of that conduct. In for a penny, you're in for a pound. Please go to crimetalksearch.com, sign up for a background subscription service. You'll be happy you did. If there's anyone out there you were ever curious about, what was in their background, now is the time to do it. If you're going to get involved with somebody, now is the time to do it. When you go to crimetalksearch.com, you put in the name, literally millions of public records are searched and a report is generated. And it's going to give you a report. If they have multiple social media accounts, you're going to find it. If they have multiple phone numbers, multiple email addresses, it's going to be found. And more importantly, you're going to get information regarding criminal history. Hopefully the person you're searching has none whatsoever, but if it's there, it's going to be found. You're going to get everything you'd want to know, whether you're going into business or whether you're going into a personal relationship, you're going to be able to find out the information you want to know. So go to crimetalksearch.com, sign up today. You'll be happy you did. And finally, our dumb criminal of the day. Police allege that a clerk by the name of Miles Jenkins got frustrated with a customer over payment and threw a big gulp filled with lemonade at the customer. Now, the incident was apparently witnessed by three other customers waiting in line. And according to the criminal complaint, Mr. Jenkins reportedly made spontaneous statements admitting to striking the victim, a woman by the name of Tina Warren, with the drink. Now, Jenkins was charged with felony battery and booked into the county jail. After being released from custody the other day, though, uh, Jenkins gave his address as a Clearwater Motel. The alleged battery is being charged as a felony due to Mr. Jenkins having a prior conviction for sexually battering a young girl, a crime for which he served several years in custody. So, Mr. Jenkins, tough being you. Um, I understand there was some issue with the payment, credit card, who knows? Maybe you couldn't count back change. I don't know. But the reality of it is you can't go around assaulting customers because you get frustrated. That's why, Mr. Jenkins, you are our dumb criminal of the day. Congratulations. You made it. If you want to come claim your prize, maybe we can help you out and get you out of that hotel at least for one night. Maybe it's some little nicer. We'll see. Call us. All right. That's all we have for you today. Thanks for joining us. Remember, it's Tuesday, which means we are going live 6 p.m. Mountain Time right here please join us. Have a wonderful day. We'll see you next time.